I own a big, fancy electric lathe. It'll handle bowls, platters, and any furniture part I want to make. So why did I build this old-style, foot-powered spring pole lathe? Am I trying to be all traditional and old-timey? No. If you go back about a 150 years, human-powered lathes were the only lathes that existed. You had to build it yourself, and you had to power it with muscle. In all my furniture forensics videos, all of those turnings were done on a human-powered lathe, probably a spring pole lathe. Making and learning to use one of these can be a big part of being a hand tool woodworker. And these shop-made wooden lathes are inexpensive. I built this whole thing for about $90. That's much cheaper than a basic electric lathe. And my spring pole lathe can handle much longer pieces, so I can make table legs and chair parts without buying a big machine. The parts are basic. I built the whole thing from four 2x4s and a single plank of red oak. I got all of it from Home Depot, and you can use any hardwood. I just picked oak because it was the cheapest. I let my 2x4s dry in the shop for about two weeks, and they bowed and twisted a lot. But now they're done moving. I can pick my pieces, cross-cut my parts, and then dress the stock smooth and square. I'm planing every piece, even the legs and the frame. This step is time-consuming, but the finished pieces will stay straight, and they'll have a clean surface that won't give me splinters. It's worth the effort. With the leg pieces done, I drilled my holes and assembled everything with bolts and wing nuts. This design is called a Manx leg, and it gives you a sturdy frame with a wide stance, using only a small amount of wood. I learned about this design from Mike Abbott's excellent books, which I totally recommend. Mike knows a lot about this stuff. A spring pole lathe is pretty big, and it can take up a lot of space in a small shop. You might need a lathe that you can take apart and store when you're not using it. So this is a knockdown design. I made the bed out of two pieces because that's really rigid and strong, and these two pieces are notched into the upright of the leg, and it just slides on like that. And then, to lock everything in place, I have an angled mortise and a hardwood wedge. Tighten the wedge with two taps, and everything is held together super strong and sturdy, and the whole thing comes apart in seconds. I made the bed out of my straightest wood. I clamped both pieces together and planed them until they were dead parallel and really smooth. Then I used the ends of the bed to lay out notches in my uprights. Cutting the notches is straightforward saw and chisel work. It's a simple joint, and after a few minutes, my bed pieces were fitting nicely. Fitting the bed to the frame was challenging, but everything was straight and square, so I made the two little spacer blocks and screwed them to the bed. Now the bed slides right onto the leg assembly, and all we need is the wedge that locks it in place. The wedge and the angled mortise seem difficult to cut, but they're pretty easy. I've got the leg location marked on the bed, and I've cut this paper template to a 1 in 7 ratio. That's a nice taper for a wedge. I'm going to move that template a little bit inside my leg location, and then trace it. I'll make the mortise by drilling two holes, one straight down and one following the slope I traced into the wood. A little bit of chisel work finishes the sides, and the mortise is done. It's got round ends, but that's no problem. After I rip my wedges and clean up the faces, I'll use the plane to round over the corners of the wedge until it matches the radius of the mortise. After a bit of fine-tuning, the wedge slips right in, and a few taps tightens it up for a solid connection. After I've done this on both ends, I'm ready to start making the moving parts. The parts that hold your workpiece and allow it to turn are called poppets, and you need at least one poppet that moves back and forth on the bed. This movable poppet is a pretty complicated part. It needs to slide back and forth, it needs to lock in place, it needs an adjustable screw so you can loosen and tighten your workpiece, and it needs to hold your tool rest. That's a lot of stuff, and this could be a very difficult part to make, but I've got a bunch of tricks, including a simple laminated construction where we're just sandwiching together pieces of hardwood. All these parts are made from oak. I'm going to cut my plank into sections, then plane the inside faces for a smooth glue joint. I'm using my Compass Rose Ready Set Planing Stop with the nylon cover. This keeps my stock free on the benchtop, but the cover keeps the teeth from marking my work. 
you can get the stop along with the cover and stainless steel screws at compassrosetools.com. Once these pieces are prepped, I stick them together with blue tape and CA glue and do all of my layout with a square and a pencil. Doing it this way keeps both pieces identical. And I'll keep the pieces stuck together while I saw and chisel out my shape. Before we glue the poppet pieces together, we need to think about this screw. On a lot of lathes, this is a specialized part. It's either made by a blacksmith or some people take a long piece of all thread and they heat it up with a torch and then kind of bend it into a crank shape. And no matter how you do it, that's a lot of work. I wanted a simple, cheap, off-the-shelf part and I've got a great solution. I used the screw from this Harbor Freight C-clamp. The clamping pad popped right off and then I just unscrewed it. It's a solid chunk of steel with thick chrome plating, a square thread, and a nice handle. All it needs is a point on the end, and that was pretty easy to make just using the bench grinder. You can also do this with an inexpensive belt sander as long as you clamp it down to something solid. To get my point, I'm just rotating that ball end against the wheel. This steel is surprisingly hard, and it takes a while to grind away enough material, so you have lots of time to check your angle and make adjustments. I just went for a smooth cone shape. I didn't measure anything. Once I had my point, I continued that taper up into the threaded section. Tapering those first few threads will make this much easier to screw into the wood. As a finishing touch, I'm going to use a triangular file to cut a couple of flutes into my tapered section. This is going to make my screw better at tapping threads into the wood poppet. The flutes will give the waste somewhere to go. A big challenge with this part is drilling a straight hole all the way through this four and a half inch wide piece of wood. If you have a drill press, that's really easy, but it's more challenging for the hand tool woodworker. But don't worry. I have a couple of great tips that are gonna make this really easy. To get that hole drilled straight, I'm going to lay out the screw location on the inside of my two pieces. Once I have a clear line to follow, I'll saw gently across it to create a shallow groove. I do this on both pieces, and when I glue them together, I get a pilot hole in exactly the right location. I also made two more pieces that I glue on the outside to complete the poppet. To turn my pilot hole into a full-sized hole, I just drill it out from both sides. I don't want to mess this up, so I start with a 1 8 inch drill bit and move up slowly, gradually widening the hole while keeping everything perfectly straight. My final hole is a full 1 half inch, which is also the largest twist bit I own, so I was glad when this hole was big enough. Getting the screw into that hole is hard work, but it's not complicated. I'm using a toothbrush to put paste wax on my screw, and I'm using a square on my bench top so I have a reference to keep it straight. Getting it started is the hard part, but after a few minutes, I can feel the threads bite in, and the screw suddenly feels very solid and stable as I thread it into the hole. Once the screw is started, there's nothing to worry about, and all you have to do is thread it in a little bit at a time stopping every once in a while to clean the wood out of the flutes and add more wax. After about 10 minutes, the point comes sticking out of the other end, and I'm done. I add this little cross piece to the back, and my poppet drops right into my bed. I can use the same angle template to mark out a mortise, then drill it out and make my wedge. And now I've got a fully adjustable poppet that I can move anywhere I want and lock in place with a few mallet taps. My second poppet is fixed in place. It's just part of the left-hand leg assembly. I designed it this way so there are fewer parts to make, but I think I regret this decision. I'll talk about that more at the end. I'm gluing on a couple of pieces of oak to make this part strong, and then I want my two centers to match perfectly, so I'll bring up my movable poppet and use the point to mark my center location on the fixed poppet. Then I can drill out my hole and install my fixed center, this is just a plain old bolt, and I ground the point just like I did with my other screw. I'm glad I took my time with this, because the two centers match up perfectly, and my work is going to spin true. The last part was a pair of adjustable tool rest holders. I attached these to the poppets with star knobs, and they let me hold different size tool rests, 
and get the tool rest further away from the work when I'm doing larger diameter pieces. They took a little time to make, but they work really well. Of course, any spring pole lathe needs a good springy pole, and my next door neighbor was nice enough to let me cut this sapling from her backyard. I jammed it up in the rafters of my shop, using a corner of the building to brace the end. Then I tied a cord to one end, wrapped it around my test piece, and tied the other end to this foot pedal I built out of furring strips and started pedaling. I've been working on this thing for a couple of weeks, and seeing it actually work is kind of a shock. So, I grabbed a gouge and started turning, and I got the hang of it pretty fast. There's a rhythm to it where you push the tool in a little bit as you push down with your foot and then back off for the return stroke. It sounds hard, but it's not. But as I was testing it, I also figured out that my design has some problems. My tool rest shouldn't be square, and I fixed that a little later, but my tool is also too high and too far away from the work. As I tested it, I figured out that both my poppets are too wide, and they push my tool rest too far away. Unfortunately, this called for significant modification. I ended up sawing big pieces off the movable poppet and the fixed poppet. And if it looks like these cuts sucked, they did. They totally sucked. I ended up doing a significant redesign to both these parts, and then the lathe worked well. It's still a little jumpy in this shot because I've got too much tension from the pole, but it's cutting way more smoothly, and I can feel that the tool is at the correct height and distance from the work. It's been a long project, but I finally got it. After all that, my spring pole lathe actually works really well, but not well enough that I'm going to put plans out. I had to modify my design quite a bit. I had to cut parts off of it. I wish I had gone with two movable poppets, because that allows you to put the workpiece anywhere you want on the bed, and that flexibility is really useful in a spring pole lathe. It's funny, <laughs> I always tell people, the first time you build something, don't get fancy with it. Don't try to innovate. Build the most basic, time-tested design you can. Learn from it and then innovate later on. And I didn't follow my own advice. I've never built a spring pole lathe before, and I tried to go directly to a fancier, more advanced version, and it didn't work out. Who could have predicted that? But now I've got one, I can practice with it, I can learn how to use it, and I'm hoping to come back to you down the road with the thing I was really hoping for. A simple, inexpensive, knockdown lathe that anybody can build and get into turning on a budget without making a bunch of noise, without having to buy a bunch of stuff. The spring pole lathe is a great way to start turning. You can make all kinds of furniture components on it. Now, a lot of people are going to ask, Rex, why didn't you build a treadle lathe with a flywheel? Didn't you want that continuous motion, not this back and forth nonsense? And the answer is no, not really. I have used a bunch of those at museums and reenactment shops, and I've never been very impressed with them. And some people who run those old wood shops have told me privately, yeah, those treadle lathes, they don't work very well. Spring pole lathes surprisingly work better. Treadle lathes are also much more difficult to build. Spring pole lathes are much simpler. That back and forth reciprocal motion, that seems like a problem, but it's not. You get used to it very quickly. And this pedal attached directly to the workpiece is like direct drive. When you push down, you put a lot of force right into the part that you're turning. It's surprisingly powerful. So if you're getting into hand tool traditional turning, I really think the spring pole lathe is the way to go. And as I was working on this, I did a whole build thread on the discussion forum of my Patreon page. I showed people everything as it was going and all the roadblocks, and I made little behind the scenes videos. My patrons have been following this project for weeks, and it sparked all kinds of amazing discussion because we have a great community. If you've been thinking about becoming part of that community, now is the time. We always need new members. Members. Your support makes stuff like this possible. I don't have sponsors. I don't read ads. I don't take free stuff. Patreon and the support of my patrons makes these projects a reality. And I appreciate it more than I can say. Patreon.com slash Rex Kruger. You get a pile of stuff for only $5 a month. 
Anyway, this project was incredibly fun. I look forward to using it and doing some projects with it, and I will keep telling you more about it. I'm going to keep you updated. So, thanks for watching.